Today I'm talking to Warren Mundine, who's Executive Chairman of the Australian Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, Chair of the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, and Chairman of the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation, among other things. Um, Warren's here today to present um, at a leadership lunch for CIS and kindly agreed to allow me to ask him some questions uh, ahead of that. So, in a speech to the Australian Institute of Family Studies in August this year, one of the things you said was that family is at the centre of society and community. If families don't function as they should, then society breaks down. Do you think this is a problem that governments can fix or is it essentially about families? Look, it's a yes and no answer. No, they just can't fix suicide. It, it, is, it is a very much a social and a very individual and family situation. Uh, so when you do have family breaks down, uh, I'll give you a good example. I was in Western Australia uh, last year with the Deputy Police Commissioner and he showed me uh, data on um, kids, on two kids, uh, a girl and a boy, both 13 years old that they, they, they were working with in the Birdswood area. In that family, they trace five generations of that family and they come up with this family tree that had, for five generations, everyone, everyone in that family excuse me, had been uh, uh, child abuse, uh, had uh, drug and alcohol problems, plus uh, quite a few of them had mental issues, uh, hadn't worked for at least three generations in that area, lived on very um, uh, social housing, and, uh, and all of them had police records, were known or were known to the police, as they say. That just shows you a, a, the total breakdown in that family. And of course, in that family, there was, there was attempted suicides and suicides as well. So that doesn't surprise me. So what I was getting to is if we have family breaks down, we have all these issues within families, then this is, this is what happens. So the, the real issue for us is how do we break through the welfare area? Now, I'm not gonna pretend I'm a psychologist or a psychiatric professional. But I do uh, work with them and I, and I talk to them a lot, saying so like uh, McGoran and Beyond Blue and groups like that. And they say the big issue for us is about, f f in Indigenous communities is, if we can get them educated and you can get them into jobs and they see a future for themselves and, and, and they break out of that cycle of poverty, they break out of that cycle of uh, welfare dependence, then you resolve most of uh, suicides in Aboriginal communities. Well, that's an optimistic kind of approach, isn't it? To think that um, that through education, through you know a fantastic thing like education, that you can um, ameliorate those problems and for a lot of kids um, set them on a different path in their lives. So it, it seems to me that, that that is the key. So on education, that the poor educational outcomes for Indigenous children um, are well known and, and particularly for Indigenous kids who don't live in the city. Yeah. Um, and sometimes this is blamed on lack of resources and sometimes it's um, blamed on, on culture, yeah. which is another um, explanation I've heard with regards to work yeah. as well. Um, and there are people who seriously suggest that trying to raise literacy levels, English literacy levels amongst um, Aboriginal children is like trying to make them more white and that yeah. it's not culturally appropriate. Um, so. Do you think there is really a conflict between traditional or even modern Aboriginal culture and, and education and work as we kind of conceptualise it? No, I don't. It? There's, a, there's, a, there's a, an, a, an elder woman from Central Australia and she, she said to me, there's three, there, there's three types of um, culture. There's white man culture, there's black man culture, and there's bullshit culture. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she was very blunt about it. Now, when you look back in, uh, into the Australia in, as a country when it, when it grew from 1788, uh, you, and I look at my own grandparents and my own experiences, uh, that they, were pe they were people who were very traditional people. They knew their ceremonies, they knew their language, and they were very much in, had their feet in both worlds. They uh, traveled, they worked in the cattle industry, um, uh, they were drovers and, uh, and they'd go away for six months at a time or three months at a time. So this idea that, uh, that Aboriginal people don't move is, is a modern, modern uh, issue. It's only since the 1970s that we've had all these issues about funerals taking people away, 
We've had uh, people that don't shift, they stay in the one area and all this stuff. Aboriginal people, you know, I always remind uh, people I'm talking to, that Aboriginal people actually invented the word walkabout. And they used to travel quite great distances. You look at the cattle industry, people used to travel from um, the Northern Territories or, or, or Western Queensland, right down to Adelaide or right across to, 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 to Derby and places like that to load cattle and ships to go. So in those days, you know, you're talking over 100 years ago, huh? they used to, they'd be gone for a year mm. to do that trip, but they still did ceremony, they still did language and they still did everything else. So uh, I think, we, you know, in this idea that you learn English uh, is uh, that whites you, that, and that's, that's rubbish. Uh, you know, language is important. Language is a living thing, uh, and and but uh, it is also a tool for breaking out of welfare areas. It is also the global language. I go to China and India and other places around the world. They all speak English, and they're, they're striving to speak English. But they're still very much Chinese. They're still very much Indian. They're still very much Japanese. It is it is about how you communicate and how you can get benefits. Now for Australia. It, you have to learn English, it's just a fact of life. And I, old people have told me this all the time. I met once a chairman of the Northern Land Council and he could speak five languages and three of them were uh, Aboriginal languages. Uh, uh, one was English, of course, and, and because of his uh, schooling upbringing, the other one was Latin, which I thought was quite bizarre. And we all know that if you do learn more than two languages, one, uh, you know, two languages or more, that it, you're, it helps with your brain functioning, it helps with your education, it helps with a whole wide range of things. So we've got to get away from this nonsense. You know, I was told as a, a person that oh, if you do business, you're, you're white. If, if you know, you're learning English, you're white. You're learning all these things and that makes you automatically white. And I'm sitting there looking at people who are dressed in Western clothes speaking English to me. And I'm sitting there going, what, what are you carrying on about? Uh, one thing we've learned is that business is not just a white man's game, it's everyone's game. Uh, you look at China and how it's changed and the communist state is now getting business people coming out. You're looking at uh, China, I mean Japan and Korea, you know, they're a Asian countries but they're very Western in, the, in, their, in their business outlet. Business is a culture of its own. It doesn't matter if you're African, um, North American, South American, European or whatever, this is business. But that doesn't stop you from being who you are in, in the world. And we see that in the world. You see businessmen coming out of India, they're very Indian, but they're still also very business. And that's, um, that situation is also true, coming back to education again, where we're looking more and more often to other countries to pick up on the things that they, they do well. Yes. Business is, is one of those areas, but um, something that you also mentioned recently was uh, charter schools, and there's been a lot of debate recently about the merits and otherwise of charter schools. and. Um, taken en masse, there are mixed success um, in other countries, but there is a certain type of charter school which is very successful, particularly with children um, from social and um, socially and educationally disadvantaged backgrounds in particular. And you mentioned those as part of you know, a number of options um, for improving or turning around chronically failing schools that, and, and a partnership model. So how do you see you know, a, a, ch a charter school model, for example, Look, working? I, I wish I could claim that to claim that be the genius of the idea. Uh, what, what it did, it come out of our subcommittee from the Prime Minister and Indigenous Advisory Council, and I, we thought it was, the council and we thought it was a very good idea. And when we had meetings with Minister Pine and the Prime Minister and Minister Scully, and they also agreed. So, so it is, we, we, look, if we're going to tackle this, the education problems within Indigenous communities, we, everything's on the table. We should not be excluding things uh, before we actually sit down and re research it and see how it operates. We saw charter schools answering a number of questions. One, it, get, it does empower the community. The community take ownership of the school and they start to, uh, the, then the school doesn't become some sort of alien thing that's dropped on into your community from afar, from Darwin or from Sydney or somewhere else, it is part of your community and you take ownership of it. And we know that when people take ownership of something, they take it very serious and they want it to grow and they, and they, want, and they start looking at the pursuit of excellence for their kids, they start looking at a number of things. The other thing about the charter schools, is how do we attract um, uh, the teachers that we do need in these communities? And one of the things we wanted to add on to that is looking at how private schools and other schools around Australia 
have these relationships. I suppose they probably come out of the local government, the sister city idea, or they got mm -hmm. the sister school idea. Now, when we talked to schools, they were saying, oh, look, our kids have a great time, the teachers have a great time, everyone's fun. And I'm sitting there going, that's wonderful, everyone's had fun, but what have you left behind? Mm -hmm. And because uh, you've got these amazing kids who are going to be in the top 99 uh, high school points. Uh, HSC points, and you've got these amazing teachers who are training these kids and working with them. So, what, so we're looking about how do we that uh, they actually sign up for a 15, <coughs> excuse me, 15 to 20 year program, where they're going into the communities. The, the students are actually acting uh, acting as uh, mentors, as 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 well, well as they're the same age as other kids. So they're having that interrelationship because the kids only listen to other kids. Yeah. So, so it's you know installing them this 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 love of education, this this empowerment of education, and and then also then you have these teachers who'll spend a term there and stuff like that, who will be able to enforce that you know, and in that community, and then also play mentors and support for the teachers who are in those communities, and also as so we're looking at about how do you shift uh, teachers' aides because most of the Aboriginal uh, teachers not in these schools are teachers' aides. So how do we shift them into being teachers and, and getting that, that full knowledge of being a teacher and how you can teach? Because uh, one of the things we have, and this is what we worked very closely with Christopher Pine on, was how do you get, if you're going to get Aboriginal languages in the schools, it's no good getting auntie down the road just because she can speak uh, Bunjalung or something like that. Because that would be the equivalent of us walking out to the green grocer and saying, oh, hey, go on, Mario, you can speak Italian. Why don't you come and teach Italian at our school? <laughs> Look no insulting Mario or my <laughs> auntie, they're not teachers. Yeah. And so we need to, how do we uh, uh, grow the teachers in the community? The other thing about that, when you start getting ownership of the school, you start getting uh, your own community ideas and that into the school, at the same time, they'll be, it's really amazing how they change. They, they want their kids to be able to perform on the global stage, because we are on a global stage, there's not a national or a state stage, when you get educated, you go onto this global stage. How do they? How can they be out there and compete and contribute, as well as soak up knowledge from that area? And so it's it's about then when you start growing your own teachers in your community, then people then you get this thing. Oh well, it's not a foreign thing here. We're not. We haven't got teachers coming from all over the world. The teachers we've got, which it's fine. But we also got our own teachers. We've got so it means that we can become a teacher. We can get educated. So you start breaking down a number of these barriers. So I think charter schools in that sense plays a massive role. Uh, look, there, there's many ways to, to skin a cat. It doesn't mean it, it, that's the answer for everything. It's not the panacea, but I think it needs to be in the mi mix. Great. Thanks, Warren. Thank you.